الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على نهجه ومستن بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Well, just, just a quick correction on the whole fast food thing. I am cutting down and I'm on a very strict diet. Okay, so I'm trying, to lose, I'm trying to lose some weight actually. Brothers and sisters, Ikhwani Fillah, I welcome you here today this evening. And as the brother has mentioned, my topic for you today is how do you hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And really, I'd like to rephrase it and say to you, how do you hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And don't say a word. Don't speak. But you focus and you concentrate on yourself. Yet you still cling on to the message of Allah, the message of His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Holding on to the rope of Allah it is an obligation on every single Muslim in the entire world of this Ummah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is the whole purpose of our creation. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Inna hadhihi ummatukum ummatun wahida fa'ana rabbukum fa'abudun or fa'ana rabbukum fattaqun. So Allah tells us that this deen, it is a religion for you. It is your Ummah, and it is only one Ummah, Ummatun Wahida. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He is your Rabb, He is your Lord, your Creator. So worship Him and fear Him as much as you can. The main concern here that we will discuss with you, insha'Allah, are some characteristics and etiquettes that you and I should follow throughout our daily lives and it causes us to be close to our religion it causes us to be close to Allah Azza wa Jal it causes us that whatever you and I are doing throughout our days we are always following the Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is the main concern of every single Muslim the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us in a good acceptable Hadith, Hadith on Hassan, Warawahu at Tirmidhi, that whomsoever seeks pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the risk of displeasing people, so whoever says to themselves, I am only going to be concerned about pleasing Allah Azza wa Jal, regardless of whatever my case is, regardless of however people look at me or deem me or see me or judge me. This is my only concern. It is Allah Azza wa Jal. Then the hadith continues and it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of him. This is number one. Will protect him from any animosity or hatred that surrounds him. So Allah Azza wa Jal puts mercy in that person's life. Simply because they chose the deen. They chose to hold on to the rope of Allah. And as a result, it is, it's by default. You get the protection of Allah and you also get the care. However, the hadith continues, but whoever seeks the pleasure of the people at the risk of displeasing Allah, and this is something you find in various aspects of our community, you find that there are people that will say or, or, or judge their lives and think that as long as I have a good intention, it doesn't really matter how I do things. Allah knows best. This is a direct result of the hadith. That you try your best to please people and please what they expect of you. And in that process, you end up displeasing Allah Azza wa Jal. What does the hadith continue to say? Allah will abandon him and also cause that the people will also abandon him. Eventually, this is what happens, and you all see it. 
If you haven't seen it, you will see it. That a person who is involved in sin, and a person who wishes to stay away from the sunnah or stay away from Allah's religion, in order that he or she can live a peaceful, satisfactory life with those around them, it is by default that this person, not only will they find that their life may have some difficulty in it, and as we've mentioned in the past, even if their life is flourishing, even if they're living the most comfortable life, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَخْذُ رَبِّكْ إِذَا أَخَذَ الْقُرَى وَهِيَ ظَانِمًا إِنَّ أَخْذَهُ أَلِيمٌ شَدِيرٌ This is the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal, that He tests people in these areas. Sometimes Allah tests people by taking away things from them. And then there are many times Allah Azza wa Jal will test us by giving us more. So don't think for a moment that just because somebody is blessed with all the ni'mah and the buyut and the sayyarat and the awlad and things like this, money, wealth, status, no matter where it is, don't think for a moment Allah loves them. But you say to yourself, either this could be a sign of love or it could be a very severe test from Allah Azza wa Jal. So brothers and sisters, first and foremost, we want to speak to you in a very general and formal fashion where we will discuss with you some of the general things that you and I can always adhere to, that we can always hold on to, that causes us to hold on to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal. Awalan, the first thing that no matter what age you are at, no matter how old or young you think you may be, you are never disqualified from falling into the position of holding on to the Qur'an. And this by mean the essence of the Qur'an is to read it and recite it as much as you can. Now this is not an appeal for you to recite Qur'an each and every single hour of the day. Because wallahi I will tell you, and many of us here are witnesses to this, if you dedicate only five minutes a day to the Qur'an, your entire life will change. In all aspects, in everything that you do. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that all of us, وَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا I'm sure you've been hearing this ayah many times today. That when you hold on to the rope of Allah, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu tells us that the rope of Allah is the Qur'an. Hold on to the Qur'an however you can. Whether it means reciting it, whether it means studying it, whether it means analyzing it, whether it means whatever the Qur'an is for you. Hold on to the Qur'an and recite it. And once you fulfill those obligations of reciting it, then you take it another step and you try to fulfill a, some sense of understanding, some sense of insight, what is Allah really telling me? What is Allah saying to me? Because it is a level of ignorance, believe it or not, when a person becomes a alim of the Qira'atul Qur'an. He becomes a beautiful reciter with all the tajweed and all of its implications. But if you ask him what does one word or one surah generally, what it means, what is it talking about, and he or she can't tell you, this is still a level of ignorance that is in the person, a level of jahl that the ulama teach us. The Prophet ﷺ continues to tell us in another authentic hadith, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمْ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ and A hadith that you and I have always heard even as a young child we've been hearing the Prophet ﷺ was sent to perfect akhlaq and manners. And so this proves to us that you hold on to the rope of Allah through your etiquettes. The true Muslim, he doesn't care what people think of him. The true Muslim, whether people slander him, put him down or stare at him, he ignores all of these minor, superficial, or minuscule issues that surround him. Especially now in our times, in our society, wherever we are, this is something that you and I face probably on a daily basis. 
But the true Muslim knows how to overlook these minor minuscule issues and still he can hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those of us here who don't know how to recite the Quran with tajweed, this is a task for you. This is a task for you. Can you imagine that when you pick up a novel and it is in English or Somali or in Arabic, whatever it is, and don't you listen to yourself that when you read the words, whatever language it is, you try to read it as well as you can. When you read English, you make sure that it sounds like English to you. Can you imagine a person reading a simple English novel and constantly making errors in all the pronunciation of all the words? This is something that is like a shameful act in front of anywhere you go. People will say to you, oh, that guy doesn't know how to read anything. That guy doesn't know English. And they look down on him. How do you think it is when a person doesn't know how to recite the Qur'an, the words of the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that the person, the reciter, the hafiz al-Qur'an is like a citrus fruit. Is like a citrus fruit, whereas the person who is not a hafiz or is not a classical reciter of the Qur'an is like a dry date. You see the difference? Just look at the a citrus fruit, just take an orange for example, and put it beside a dry date and look at the difference. Observe for yourself. One of it is sweet, is tasty, and majority of people when they eat it, they are pleased with it. They love it, it's healthy, everything, else, everything about it is good. Whereas one, it is the complete antithesis, it is the complete opposite. Its appearance is bad. Its odor might have, a, it might, might have a problem with it. Everything as you look at a dry date or a dried fruit, you can see for yourself the difference between that and something that is fresh. Also, brothers and sisters, as we continue to discuss this point about reading the Qur'an often and being close to it, we continue to mention that as you do this, Continue to make dua that Allah Azza wa Jal protects you from being lazy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always known to raise his hands and make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal calling upon him and say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kasal. Can you imagine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to ask Allah, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the evils of laziness from the evils of laziness so let's put this into perspective let's say a brother he wakes up at Fajr time and he prays his Fajr and he goes to work all throughout the days for 12 hours he says 12 hours it's very unusual that you find somebody here in Toronto working beyond that so he works for 12 hours. So let's say he's home at 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening. Once he gets home, he has his dinner, he spends time with his family, and then he knocks out, he sleeps. And then this is the same system that he has each and every day. And then he says to you that I can't find any time for the Qur'an, not even five minutes, I can't find it. Wallahi, he is lying to you. And all of you sitting here, if you are ever in this position where you feel that you don't have the time, you can't spare a moment, you are lying to yourself. And let me tell you how. A Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of our time, he used to sit in the car, and as many of you know, he was a Sheikh that was blind. So he used to have a driver. Do you know that the Sheikh, rahimahullah, finished volumes of books, finished reading volumes of books whilst only sitting in the car with his driver. That's it. He had a special series of books that he wanted to read and he designated only the time that he sat with his driver that this is the time that he would finish this book or he would read this book. Other than that, as soon as he steps out of the car, he says, okay, close the book, we're not reading that no more. 
In the past, you will find many scholars have done this. Many of the mashayikh, even as they perform their wudu, you will find that some of the mashayikh used to have a person beside them. And they would have that person to write for them as they perform wudu. Some of the scholars, including Al-Imam Al-Nawwi rahimahullah, have put together authentic books just during their daily chores. During their daily chores. And so the person here who finds themselves that they are working hours and hours and then they only have a small portion of time for, the, for themselves and their family, that time that they go to work, that time that they return, the breaks that they have, even if it's just two minutes, hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, we continue. Another appeal of how do you hold on to the rope of Allah through the etiquettes and manners is that this is number two, you try to live a very moderate life in this dunya. And whatever the level of moderacy is, so for some of us, being moderate means that whatever I get, I'm happy with it and this is it. Others strive for much more. And don't think for a moment that it is haram for you to strive to live a very comfortable life in this dunya. The Prophet ﷺ praised the wealthy person as long as they use the wealth in a good manner. They use the wealth for Allah They use the wealth to do the right things. The Prophet ﷺ praised this person and praised wealth in this manner. And so being moderate in how you live your lifestyle and how much wealth you acquire this is also an aspect of our etiquettes that helps us to hold on to the rope of Allah Azza Don't be of those that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala asks a rhetorical question in Surah Al-Takathur. Al-Hakum Al-Takathur Hatta Zurtum Al-Maqabir Are you still in a state of play where you are trying to collect as much as you can? You're trying to consume as much as you can. When is this going to stop or when is it going to relax itself and become moderate? Hatta zurtum al maqabir. Is it going to end when it's time for you to reach your graves? Whenever I look at the surah, it's very frightening to know how Allah Azza wa Jal is speaking to us here. I mean, it sounds profound. It sounds like Allah is refuting us. Allah is upset speaking here. Hatta zurtumul maqabir. Are you going to be in this state until you reach your graves? And this surah has an interesting story to it. Once there was a time when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and Umar radiallahu an, and Fatima radiallahu anha, four individuals, once the t there was a time when the Prophet ﷺ walks out of his home after Dhuhr. Those of you who have been to the Middle East, you know what after Dhuhr is like outside. It's hot, it's sunny, and most of the Middle East still observe that when during that time stores are closed and everybody stays indoors. So the Prophet ﷺ is walking outside. And he sees Abu Bakr, and he sees Umar radiallahu anhum. So they see him, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing outside at this time? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns the question on them and said, what are you all doing here? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we are hungry and we are looking for food. Allahul Musta'an. The companions are the people who should be the richest people in the world. They should have the most wealth because they are the ones who carried Islam to us. Yet you find companions, they are searching for food on the hottest time of the day. And Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum, they lift up their garment and they showed the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that each of them had a large stone tied at their stomachs in order to constrict and hold the hunger that they were feeling. What do you think the Prophet ﷺ did? He lifts up his garment and you find that there were two stones. ﷺ. Two stones. So they see another companion. 
And this companion invites them, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he invites them to their home. He sees all of them gathering, speaking, so he says, come in. If you need food, I have food. And they sit down, he goes and he slaughters a sheep and he prepares it and he brings it with some bread. Remember, the hadith is very specific. It mentions sheep or meat and bread, two items alone. And I want you to pay attention to this. Only two items are mentioned. And so, the Prophet ﷺ is sitting. Abu Bakr and Umar and the third companion, now they are all here sitting. Now we have four people. The Prophet ﷺ orders that Fatima radiallahu anha come because she has not seen this type of food in a long time. Order her to come. So she comes. And the Prophet ﷺ in, in, tells all of those who are sitting there eating this food, he says, Wallahi, Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us about this extravagance that we are enjoying. This amount of food that you and I are enjoying right now, Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us about this. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ so there will come a time where they were asked about how moderate they were in their eating, in their sleeping, in their lifestyle. And today, mashaAllah, today <laughs> we want everything from the rice to the salad to the sauce to the dessert to the juice and bring a milkshake and bring this fruit and bring that fruit. And then subhanAllah, this is okay to an extent. But the problem is, is that when you finish eating, you find that half the rice is sitting on the floor. You find that half the food is still sitting here. We don't realize that Allah Azza wa Jal actually is going to bring us where you say, you know, on this food. is going to bring us account. And He will ask us, Ya Fulan, O Ahmed, O Muhammad, O Salih, O Fatima. And He will ask us, this day you ate this food, why did you leave it? Don't you realize that there are people out there who are still searching for the same grains of rice that you and I enjoy? So hold on to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal by being moderate in your lifestyle. Another aspect of this point is the way you and I, we take care of ourselves. The way we groom ourselves, the way our appearance is. For the Muslim human being, the Muslim, whether they are male or female, there is one common characteristic that we all share together, and that is cleanliness in our appearance. Do you know that the Prophet ﷺ hated the person who was scruffy, who was untidy? He disliked this person. Even if he didn't know him, he disliked him. A person who might have their clothes and their garments all, you know, all over the place, their beards are sticking everywhere. The Prophet ﷺ disliked this untidiness. And actually it is a sunnah, it is actually a sunnah that a person combs his beard, combs his hair, and dresses with whatever attire that he has, whatever he can afford. This is not an appeal that you go out and you buy the most expensive garments and you wear it, and you say, Alhamdulillah, now I'm clean and now I'm groomed to perfection. This is not the case. There are scholars today, and I've met some of them, who live even at this very moment in our age and our time, who live with no less than two garments. There are ulama of our time that still live this way. And when you sit with them and you watch them, you will think that these are truly the wealthiest people on earth because of the way they take care of themselves. Al-Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he was always noted for one very important part of his life. Al-Imam Malik, each and every time, he would come and begin to discuss and uh, narrate a hadith. He would go into his home and he would find the cleanest brand new garment that he could find. He would even cut his nails. He would trim his mustache. He would make sure that he is groomed to perfection so that he would be musta'id, so that he would be ready to narrate the, uh, the hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa 
And as a matter of fact, there are many instances where scholars have come to visit Imam Malik in his home. And he says to them, wait, wait outside, I will come to you. And what do you think Imam Malik rahimahullah is doing? He goes back into his home, he showers himself, he gets the best clothes that he can find only to meet his guests. And he says, yes, how can I help you? This was something that was constant with Imam Malik rahimahullah. And many of the scholars of our time, they still uphold to this type of adherence to their cleanliness. And so brothers and sisters, this is not an appeal that you all go to this level. But to be conscious of and aware that the Prophet ﷺ tells us half of our Iman, half of our submission to Allah is through our cleanliness. How does it feel that when you pray beside somebody and there is a strong odor coming from that person? How does that make you feel? Doesn't that distract you and it distracts your relationship to Allah Azzawajal? It causes you to be unaware how do you think the person who is causing that order, what level are they at in front of Allah? And so cleanliness, brothers and sisters, it is an urge, it is an appeal that each and every time of our, mo every moment of our lives, we try our very best to groom our appearance. For the Muslim, wallahi, he is beautiful on the inside and as well as the outside. The Muslim is a person, when you look at him, you see beauty in him. And when you speak to him, you see beauty in him. This is what the Muslim is. And so brothers and sisters, if you ever find yourself that you become lackadaisical with this point, then this is an appeal. Hold on to the rope of Allah through the etiquette of cleanliness. The next point, number three choosing proper companions and this is something that I seclude only for our youth and our youngsters and so for the adults I ask you for your indulgence and to bear with me for a moment as I address the Shabab youth teenagers youngsters high schoolers university students I speak to you now and I say to you choose proper companions your friends will define you your friends will define who you are. You may think that you are a good person, you don't do anything wrong, and everybody loves you and you're just moderate type of guy. Realize that just by simply having the company that is opposite to you, so let's say you have friends that smoke, that drink, that do haram things, or even if they are Muslim and they never pray, realize that you are also associated with this type of person. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us in an authentic hadith that a human, the person, he is on the religion of his friends. He is on the way of life of his friends. So authentic hadith in Bukhari wa Muslim. A person is on the religion of their friends, their companion. So look to see who it is that you befriend. Who is that person that you stick with, that you talk to, that you seek advice from, that you confide in? Whenever you have a problem, look and see what kind of advice do you get back in return. If you have a problem at home and you say to your friend, man, my parents, my mom, my dad, I can't stand them. I can't stand what they, how, how they treat me. Do you, listen to what the friend says to you. Does he say to you, forget about them. Just do whatever you want. <laughs> this is Canada. Do whatever you want. Or does the friend say to you, Akhi, ittaqillah. These are your parents. Allah orders you to respect them. So be, just try to respect them. Be respectful and caring to them. Overlook their mistakes. Sure, their parents, they have emotions. Sure, they might lose their patience. Have respect for them. Even if you disagree, disagree with honor. So children, do you remember that famous prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam? Who was his number one sworn enemy? It was his father. His father was his number one enemy. His father actually tried to get the entire village during that time to go against his son, to get rid of his son. 
He tried many times to kick his son out of the home because why his son came with Tawheed and his father was the complete opposite. His father was a tradesman who used to build and create idols for worship. And what did his son respond? After his father kept telling him, I hate you, get away from me, I will have you killed, I will have you removed from this village. His response to his father is, Ya Abati, oh my beloved father, I will ask Allah for forgiveness for you. I will ask that Allah forgive you and I will leave. This is his response. So whenever you disagree with your parents, whenever you find that you have company that have nothing good to say except instill in your heart hatred, instill in your heart sins, you need to recognize who it is that you befriend. Because there will come a time where you will stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jalla and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala tells us how to choose our friends in Surah Al-Furqan. If you ever want to know how to choose friends, go to Surah Al-Furqan. And Allah tells you how to choose the friends that you should have. And He tells us that if you choose friends that are disobedient to the Qur'an and to the Sunnah, you will come on the Day of Judgment biting your knuckles in fear of Allah. And you will say, Ya Laytani, Ya Laytani, oh how I wish, how I wish that I could have taken that friend who was upon the Qur'an and Sunnah. How I wish I had that friend to stay with me. How I wish I could be with that person throughout my time. The dunya, as the Prophet ﷺ tells us, in an authentic hadith narrated in Al-Bukhari wa Muslim, Ad-dunya mal'oona. This earth, it is cursed. And just so that you and I don't sit and we think, well, not everything is cursed. I mean, this part of it is cursed. This thing is cursed. But not everything is cursed. Look at the, look at the wisdom in the Prophet ﷺ. He says, mal'oonu ma fiha. So everything in it is cursed. So that takes out that, that, that thinking immediately. With the exception of three things. Three things are exempted from the curse of Allah Azza wa Jal. Number one, dhikrullah. Remembrance of Allah, whatever that means for you. Whatever the sunnah tells us and teaches us how to make remembrance of Allah. Wa ma wa lahu. Anything that helps you remember Allah. So students, let me give you an example. Suppose you're walking by yourself and you're in the university campus or you're at high school and you see something haram and you look at it and you say astaghfirullah you have made dhikrullah you have remembered Allah Azza wa Jal let's use the same example let's say you and a friend now are walking at school or walking outside and your friend sees something haram and you tell your friend ya akhi say astaghfirullah what's wrong with you you know, you stop him, you helped him. Wama walahu. Anything that helps the remembrance of Allah, it is also exempted from the curse of Allah. So just by you helping somebody remember Allah, you are exempted from this curse. Wa'aliman aw muta'aliman. This is the third category, and that is the student of knowledge or the scholar, and those who are like the, the layman when it comes to knowledge, the average Muslim. Because the Prophet ﷺ knows that not everybody is going to be scholars. So even if you are a person just struggling, trying to get by, trying to learn a, a bit of Arabic, trying to learn just how to read, you are exempted from the curse of Allah. And so students, be careful who it is that you choose to befriend. And be careful who it is that you choose to seek your advice. And parents, I have this to say to you. Realize is that if your children are not coming to you, asking you for advice, asking you for guidance, realize that they are doing it with somebody else. If your parents aren't, if your children aren't coming to you, and if you don't take the initiative and ask them, how was your day? How was school? How was that exam? Why do you look like this today? You look down, you look sad, you look upset, and you don't have that inquisitive mind to understand your children. 
realize that they are opening their hearts, their thoughts, and their mouths to somebody that might say to them, don't worry about your parents. Okay, if they're not there for you, that means they don't love you. Leave the home. Run away. This is the advice they will get. And so, choose the proper companions. And this is, will assist us to hold on to the rope of Allah. Number four. How do we behave as a community? What are the etiquettes? What are the conduct that you and I must have? as a community, coming to the masjid, coming to the conference, in, in interacting with each other as Muslim brothers and sisters, how do we behave? Number one is that you always try to have a generally positive attitude. No matter what the situation is, no matter how bad things may be, no matter how rough times can be, you always try to keep a positive attitude. And this is something that my mother, Hafizahullah, she constantly instills into my heart because there were times when I was in Medina, things used to get rough. Okay, being a single guy in Medina, by yourself, trying to figure out how to cook, putting sugar when you're supposed to put salt and all that sort of thing. And then you tend to give up and you say, you know what, I can't do this. And there were many times this is something personal I'll share with you. There were many times where I felt I needed to leave and I couldn't study anymore. Because things do get rough. Life do, does get difficult when you leave a house where you see your mother and your father and your brothers and your sisters and everybody. And you leave all of this for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. There is a hardship, as the Salaf used to tell us. Anybody who wishes to prepare a path of seeking knowledge, let him put on his metal shoes. Prepare for hardship. It's going to be tough. And there were times I felt like I was going to give up. And I would tell my mother on the phone, I don't want to stay here. I'm coming home. No, you have to stay. Be positive. Think about what uh, the rewards are. My mother was the one who would remind me, do you know that there's a fish out there making dua for you? SubhanAllah. And we all know the hadith. Hatta al hitanu fil ma. Even the fishes in the sea, the animals that live in the sea, they make dua for the talib al ilm. So my mom says, you know, maybe this fish that I have here in the house, I should have just left it in the ocean so that he can make dua for you. So this is what I say to all of us here. Always we keep a positive attitude. We always think that Allah Azza wa Jal, whatever He does, there is a purpose behind it. Realize that one of the attributes of Allah is that He doesn't make things or doesn't create things without a purpose. And if you and I don't understand the purpose, what is our ruling? سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear it, and if we don't really understand the wisdom behind it, we obey. It's authenticated, it is from the Qur'an and Sunnah, so we accept it. And so brothers and sisters, this is how we behave in our communities and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us in an authentic hadith in Bukhari wa Muslim, the best of people in their attitudes is their attitude towards others. So the best of you is the attitude that you have towards others. How do you treat people? How do you speak to each other? How many times have you seen that when somebody wants to give advice, they might blurt it out? You know, you might be sitting in a masjid or somewhere, and a brother or a sister, she sees something that is haram, and, she's, and all of a sudden you hear this salt, you hear this voice, Brothers, this is haram and you should follow the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And everybody looks and says, who's this? What's going on? Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, this used to happen to him a lot. Whenever you read the seerah of these a'imma, wallahi, you find yourself, there is nothing that these people are not going through that we see here in our lives. They've gone through everything. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, used to confront this that there were people who would wish to who disagree with him or they want to give him some advice about something but he would only listen to them based on the manner the attitude that they would present 
So the person who would complain or the person who would give advice with a loud voice and embarrass himself and others, what did Imam al-Shafi'i do? He ignored them. He walked away. There were times even narrated that he would actually turn his back to the person speaking. Rahimahullah. So this is how the level it is when somebody gives advice and they don't present the attitude where that advice can be accepted. Scholars of Islam today teach us that if a person does not know how to conduct himself in advice, let him remain quiet. For he is غير مستحق للدعوة. He doesn't deserve to give da'wah until he changes this attitude. And this is based on the hadith and many ayat in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to keep a good attitude amongst each other. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى Okay, and the believers, they are brothers to each other. They are close to each other. They speak to each other well. They treat each other well. And a hadith that you and I know, constantly we hear it. None of you truly believes in the hour and the day of judgment unless he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Furthermore, brothers and sisters, in conclusion to this portion of the topic, I say to you that a person who has good akhlaq will be at the highest rank of the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ tells us this in an authentic hadith that the person with good akhlaq will be at the highest level of Jannah. They will be at the highest status. And so this is also an indication that this is the description of those who will enter Paradise. The people who will enter Paradise will always be those who have good akhlaq, good manners. And mind you, before we continue, just because I say that we have to in, adhere to our etiquettes and our akhlaq and our manners, this is not an exemption that we have to seek knowledge and learn. No, but this is how you tie two things together. How many times have you met people who are doctors, who have PhDs in Islamic theology or they have PhDs in whatever knowledge, but when you speak to them, they have the worst akhlaq. They can't speak, they address you in a very aggressive manner. They're mean, they're upset, all of these things. Whereas the person who has a moderate style, he is very low in knowledge. As a matter of fact, he may know nothing about Islam. But every time you meet him, he smiles. Every time you greet him, he greets you with, with care and love. He greets you as though he is looking forward to seeing you again. He gives you that indication, that level of comfort that you, he loves you for the sake of Allah. This is where you want to be. Seeking knowledge, brothers and sisters, it is secondary from akhlaq. Akhlaq is here. Seeking knowledge is beneath it. Imam al-Shafi'i's mother told Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah when he was getting himself ready to go and study with Imam Malik in Medina he, she tells him ta'allam min amalihi qabla ilmihi go and learn from his actions first observe him, watch him, watch how he sits, watch how he eats, watch how he interacts with people then go and study from him learn akhlaq first then you will be able to grasp and accept knowledge. Brothers and sisters, we continue. At this point here in our short discussion, I wish to address, address only the brothers. And sisters, I will address you immediately after. But as for the brothers here, this portion of this discussion is for you. And so brothers, I ask you that as a Muslim man, there are certain etiquettes that will help you hold on to the rope of Allah whether you realize it or not. And they are the most trivial things, the most simplest of things that you can do to hold on to the rope of Allah. Number one, brothers, is to the importance of the lihya, the beard. Brothers, and sis brothers realize, scholars don't have differences of opinion on growing a beard. This is bil ijma. All scholars of al-Islam, past and present, are ittafaqu. They agree 
that it is wajib for a man to have something on his face that is called a beard. Now how long should that beard be? Should it be this length, that, that length? This is where the ikhtilaf comes in. But we won't, we won't be speaking about that. What this here, here, what I want to mention to you is that this symbol of our Muslim character is enough to cause us to hold on to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why? Because it preserves who you are. Do you know that just by having a beard on your face, you would look in the mirror every single day and you will always remember that you are a God-fearing man, that you are a Muslim. You will always have this inclination in your heart and in your mind that as you look at yourself in the mirror, you could do anything you want to this beard. But because you have that beard and you have it and you recognize it and others recognize that you have something called a beard on your face, it is consciousness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And realize brothers and sisters, brothers when you grow this beard, realize that Allah Azza wa Jal is rewarding you each and every moment that you keep a beard. Each and every moment. And what is it? It's just some hair, you don't do anything. And if you really want to put it into a practical sense, it's even cheaper to grow a beard than to shave it, right? You don't have to go and buy anything, you don't have to shave, you don't have to trim, you don't have to go barber, you don't have to do nothing. You just keep a nice beard, you comb it, and do what the Prophet ﷺ encouraged and what he used to do, use olive oil, and this is a natural cleansing uh, material for the beard, natural cleansing element. And as you all know, olive oil is a miracle from Allah Azza wa Jal. Wa wa zaytun. Allah swears by the olive. Can you imagine that in the Quran, Allah talks about the olive itself. So olive oil, it is something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to groom his beard with. And used to keep it healthy and clean. And those of us here who, MashaAllah, may Allah Azza wa Jal reward you that you have a beautiful, massive beard, may Allah Azza wa Jal increase you. And why I say this is that once you keep that beard, do not forget the other aspect of that beard and how to maintain. How do you maintain that beard? Because you find that there are some Muslims that SubhanAllah, may Allah guide them. They judge people based on their appearance immediately. They judge them even on the beard. The beard is always a hot topic for some brothers. And I remember meeting a brother who said, you know, we were sitting for iftar, you know, Brother Musa, and I saw this brother with a long beard, and as he was eating, his beard was in his food. I don't want to be a part of this kind of a religion. This is what the brother said. I don't want to be a part of this. Look how filthy this is. <laughs> I turned to the brother and I said, may Allah Azza wa Jal give you hidayah give you guidance because you do not realize yeah this is just a small flaw in the brother okay fine he needs to push himself back and eat in an appropriate manner but the beard it is a sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it is something that every single man when he adheres to it he practices it realize that Allah azza wa jal is rewarding you for it Another aspect, brothers and sisters, and we have mentioned this, so we will just zoom over really quickly, is our cleanliness, our tidiness. I see that many of us here, and as I speak to you, you might notice, I want to speak to you at a personal level. I want to speak to you as a brother to a brother. I see that many of us here have kufis or hats on, uh, on our heads. Let me tell you something that a Sheikh Mukhtar a shanqiti Hafizahullah, once told me. I had my hat on my head, okay, this is in Medina. And it was twisted to the side like this. Because as a matter of fact, you know, when I heard that I had an opportunity to meet the Shaykh, I got ready quickly in my home. I didn't even iron my thobe, nothing. I was so excited, I was going to meet Shaykh Mukhtar. So I got myself ready quickly and I just put the kufi on my head and I ran to the masjid. And when I met to the Shaykh, you know what the Shaykh told me? I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but Alhamdulillah, the Sheikh changed my life. He said, he said, Akhi, fix yourself. <laughs> fix yourself. So what did I do? I just kind of fixed my thobe like this. And he said, you're, you're kufi, you're taqiyah. Fix this. 
And I said, what, I, I, I'm confused, I don't know what to do. So I said, Sheikh, you know, Arini, show me what, what should I do? And the Sheikh took his hand and he fixed my hat. And he says, Hakad al Muslim. He said, This is how the Muslim is. The finest details, the finest minuscule things. And as a matter of fact, from that point on, you better believe it, I had the best kufi, the best thob. I was always slicked out and ironed, and I was good and ready to go every single moment. This is what the ulama, rahmatullahi alayhim, teach us. This is how they encourage us. And even if you don't wear a kufi and you don't wear a thobe, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is that you wear, however it is you keep your hair, whatever it is that you do, you keep yourself in the conduct, in the manner that your appearance is pleasing to Allah and to pleasing to those around us. S thirdly, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> especially to our brothers, is that I discuss with you another aspect of how we conduct ourselves, how we conduct ourselves in our domestic relationships with our wives. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, never you will find in the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he ever argued with one of his wife. He never came into a confrontation with one of his wives. Did the wives try to do that with him? That's another story. But the Prophet wasallam handling his wives, showing his superiority, showing his power, his strength over them, this is something unheard of in the Sunnah. Not even a da'if hadith is written about this, that the Prophet wasallam used to do this. Instead, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Whenever there was a problem with him and his wives, and there was some kind of, you know, there's some kind of issue comes up, and the wives get upset, what did the Prophet ﷺ used to do? First thing that he would do, is he would give them time to cool down or to relax. Give them their space. Not to sit and argue with them and say, well, what's wrong with you? Why are you behaving like this? Why are you doing this? I'm the, I'm the one who takes care of this house. You need to respect me. And in some cases here, and I've received emails about this. Some cases, some of the men use physical force against their wives. Muslim brothers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring correction to them. These are the people that come and with this type of relationship with your wife, let me tell you, it will be a direct reason that causes the marriage to be ruined. A person like this, who handles their women to this manner, who handles their, their, the situation like this, <laughs> it's kind of funny actually, it's never happened. Psst. <laughs> Um, who handles their manners in this, in, in, this, uh, in this way, brothers and sisters. It is something that is hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is hated by the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his sunnah. So we will wrap up insha'Allah ta'ala and I will conclude with mentioning just one final point for our sisters directly to them. And we will conclude insha'Allah ta'ala. For the sisters, I conclude with you and I say to you, your hijab that you wear is who you are. It defines you. And never for a moment should you think that your hijab is only an outside garment that you wear that beautifies you. The essence of the hijab is internal. It's within you. How you speak, how you talk, how you laugh, how you... How you, talk, how you discuss with each other, how you communicate, how you relate to one another. This is the internal hijab that is more superior than the external hijab. And we receive complaints constantly, brothers and sisters, especially to our sisters. Constantly we receive complaints that sisters come to the masjid and they want to hear qala Allah and qala Rasul, and yet they hear laughter and chatter and crying and things like this. Sisters realize, your hijab is not only an external part of you, it is the internal part of you. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us that shyness, al-hay, 
It is akhlaq. It is the essence of being who you are. Being shy and being moderate, this is the essence and this is what defines you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed shower His love and His mercy to all of our brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower His forgiveness and care upon each and every one of us. These are the words that I leave you with brothers and sisters. Hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your akhlaq and through your etiquettes. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.